All right. Well, we're getting that presentation up there. I, I just want to say a big thank you to Amy for having me here. I'm honored and humbled to speak with some amazing presentations, and it makes for uh, quite a hard act to follow. So, you know, getting that out of my system. I also realize that I am the last speaker before lunch. So I will be nice and quick for everybody here. Um, so I appreciate the kind introduction here. I want to be honest about my background and, and where I come from and how I got to this project, because I think it's an important way to set the stage before we really jump into this. Um, 10 years ago and one week today, I started my career at Merrill Lynch, working on their CDO desk and working very closely with the credit derivative structuring team. And for all the non-finance people out there, Basically, that means I was the cause of the credit crisis and the Great Recession. Uh, but it actually gets better. Uh, <laughs> in 2009, I started trading high yield and distressed bonds, and I ended up focused on the oil and gas sector. And uh, yeah, <laughs> fair point over there. And, and so I, my, what I take away from this is that um, it's fun working on trading floors. It can be lucrative, but only in the short term. I was on probably the most unsustainable career path that I could imagine. But I bring this up for a reason. I think with all this darkness, there's some light that comes out of it, and it's the financial skill set to be able to do things like this, like the forest resilience bond um, that I'm going to talk about today. So as you mentioned, uh, we're fortunate to be funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and to have great partners in the World Resources Institute and Encourage Capital. And it allows us to do one thing and one thing only, and that's focus on this forest resilience bond. At a really high level, what we want to do is to allow private capital to fund much needed forest restoration work to make watersheds in the West more climate resilient. So investors, um, they're able to earn their returns based on the positive environmental incomes, uh, outcomes of this, as well as the successful implementation of this work. And those returns come from federal land managers like the Forest Service, uh, public and private utilities, and the state government in some cases. So in the next few minutes, I'm gonna run quickly through the problem that we face uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the financing works, but I'm going to be really quick there. So if you have specific questions, come find me afterwards. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the role of private capital and talk about the size of this opportunity. So many people don't know this, but the biggest environmental challenge that we face uh, in watersheds across the Western US, I'm from California, but I think it's relevant here in Idaho as well, um, is dramatically overgrown forests. And to see what this looks like, I've included some nifty graphics uh, from the Forest Service. Uh, the bottom left is what the Sierra Nevadas looked like in 1929. And on the right is what they look like today, with up to 10 times as many trees as nature intended. And it's this overgrowth, when combined with increasingly hotter and drier climates, that create the tinderbox conditions that made 2015 the worst wildfire season in history. And this is an anomaly. We've had the five worst wildfire seasons in history have all happened since 2004. And I think it's pretty clear the environmental and social consequences of this are catastrophic. More wildfire means higher carbon emissions, the destruction of habitat, the destruction of homes, and the loss of human lives. And to give you one example, uh, the Rim Fire, which hit California in Tuolumne County near Yosemite uh, in 2013, uh, burned for a little bit less than a month and released as much carbon as 2.3 million cars would over the course of a year. At the same time, California is experiencing its worst drought in over 1,200 years, and it's the snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas that provide about 65% of our water supply. And while we can't change how much it snows, we can change how much water is collected to that snowpack through better managed forests. So, you know, the good news here is that there's a clear and straightforward solution. Uh, forest restoration, forest management, sometimes called thinning, is the strategic removal of overgrowth, and that's mostly small trees and shrubs that are the latter fuels that contribute to intense wildfire, and they also consume much needed water resources. This is actually an everyday activity of the Forest Service. Uh, it's endorsed by countless academic experts for a diverse set of benefits that include obviously reducing the risk of fire, reducing carbon emissions, but also protecting water quality, enhancing the amount of water quantity that's available for downstream consumptive use in reservoirs, as well as hydropower generation. Um, and there's also the social aspect of people aren't displaced after a large fire, and you can actually create sustainable local uh, rural jobs. And in California, as I'm sure it's true here, we have serious rural unemployment issues of 15, 16, 17%. So if this is so great, why aren't we doing it? Well, we are doing it, and the Forest Service is doing it to some extent, but they're not doing it at the pace and scale uh, that they need to do it to really affect this issue. And I think what we have from a budgetary standpoint is a little bit of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde issue where we have a long-term problem, 
and we have one year budget cycles. And what that does is we see more and more fires, which end up siphoning the funding away from doing this restoration work that could pre prevent these fires in the first place. What you see here is what the Forest Service spent on fire suppression, 16% of their budget in 1995. That ballooned to 52% last year in 2015. And the Forest Service believes that if left unchecked, this will be over two thirds of their budget by 2025, only 10 years from now. So our goal is to break this vicious cycle um, by bringing in investor capital to accelerate the pace and the scale of this restoration work because ultimately this is a problem of urgency or immediacy. This work needs to be done tomorrow, not 10 years from now when we can finally afford to have it done. So um, I think the other notable difference in the structure is we're able to capture some of the private benefits. Um, if you think about a water utility, they're responsible for managing these watersheds that are just like systems. They become less productive, they become less reliable. If you have this overgrowth, if you have this significant fire, these are just a quick look at some of the benefits and it differs from utility to utility, electric utility, water utilities, but there's a substantial amount of water related benefits from doing this work. So in order to capture that, we're trying to challenge the status quo of having the Forest Service or other federal land managers be the only payers for this restoration work. In fact, we're going to allow private capital to fund this work on an upfront basis and then have all the different beneficiaries pay their fair share through what's called a pay for success contract. And the nice thing about that is it actually lets you pay for the benefits after you receive them. So I don't have to go pitch a utility and say, you need to put all this money in upfront because it's going to be great for you. We're actually going to measure and evaluate these benefits and then they're going to make payments based on that. So here's a quick look at how it works. Investors will provide funds to an investment vehicle, which will then pay an implementation partner to actually do this restoration work. Um, the implementation partners in this case would be state forestry departments like CAL FIRE in California or large NGOs like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. The Forest Service and utilities then benefit financially um, from the reduction in fire risk and all the water benefits that we've mentioned. Over the next 10 years, they then pay back the investment vehicle, which provides the cash flow for the investors. Uh, now, we realize we need to crawl before we run, so we're going to be piloting this in the middle of 2017, hopefully have two more pilots up and running in 2018, but what we ultimately would like to see this get to are transactions that are done on a watershed by watershed basis where the capital raised will range from about $50 million to $250 million um, per deal. So when you think about this in the end, investors get market rate returns. The Forest Service and utilities get this restoration work done and at a discount because of the cost sharing. And we have all the great environmental impacts that, that we've talked about already. So I think this is an important point. Um, why do we need private capital? This is the question I get from every state and federal government agency that we talk to. Um, not so much from the utilities, but certainly from all the government folks. And I think there's four points here. The first is it's a huge untapped resource. I used to say hundreds of billions of dollars there, and someone said, oh, that sounds ridiculous. Just change it to billions. But when you heard all the other speakers that we've had come through this, this conversation, that number's probably realistically in the trillions. Um, preventative funding, I think I've made this pretty clear that the Forest Service doesn't have the funds to do the preventative work that can actually stop this vicious cycle. We need private capital to come in and augment that capital uh, to make this work and to get out of that vicious cycle. The third one is a little subtle, but it's important too. By bringing in private capital first, you allow all the beneficiaries to pay on an ex post basis or after these benefits are received, which for utilities, these can be avoided costs, they can be revenue enhancing. So paying a portion of that once you've already seen the savings or recognize more water um, is a much easier way to bring them to the table. And then I think the last one, this is probably the most important, is that we're hopeful that this will set a precedent for public-private partnerships um, that will allow conservation, environmental resilience, uh, climate adaptation, and really change the way that it's funded. Um, the other thing here is this will keep public land public. I think a lot of strategies um, around conservation are about buying up lands for conservation and conservation easements. This is just a better way to manage federal land while keeping public land public, and I want to stress that. Uh, the last point I'd make here is that we've been talking about thinning and forest restoration and the water benefits of doing that for watersheds in the western U.S., but all this is is sort of three parts infrastructure and one part ecosystem services, whether that's um, credits, uh, carbon credits, or money coming from fish and game from increased angling. It can be any of these things that can be subbed in, and I hope this is a structure in these contracts uh, can make that easier for everybody to finance whatever conservation finance challenge they have in the future. So 
I'll wrap up by saying, by deploying private capital here to address what's really a public budget crisis, we can accelerate the restoration work across 58 million acres in need, and that's just forest service land. That translates to a $41 billion market opportunity. And by bringing all these beneficiaries to the table, we can make this restoration work as financially sustainable um, as it is environmentally sustainable. So thank you very much for your time.